All right, Emmanuel. Yes. Emmanuel, uh, where'd you grow up? Where'd you, where are you from originally? I was born in the very southern tip of Louisiana, um, down in the swamps. We traveled more by boat than car. Was, I was exercised for demon possession at the age of four. Really? Yeah, it was a heavy, heavy, uh, it was, you know, kind of like Eastern Europe. It was very rural. There's a lot of superstition. Yeah. And uh, my stepfather, he, uh, his mom and aunt were very, very Catholic, like the black lace around the hair and everything. And I was having these incredible stomach pains that couldn't be explained. They kept taking me to a doctor and uh, couldn't figure it out. Plus I was having these unbelievable nightmares. And for a kid that age, I would wake up screaming and describe these horrific scenes that I could only describe as like kind of Genghis Kong-ish, like these raiders on horses going in and just Ra ter killing everyone, slaughtering people in these villages. And I'd wake up and tell this to my mom and they were all freaked out because why does a little kid have these images and these brutal images? And the thing is in the, in, the, in the dreams, I was part of it. It was like I was living it. So anyway, they kept, I kept waking up from this and they tried doctor after doctor and they couldn't figure anything out. So they wanted the, my stepfather's mother and aunt suggested an exorcism and at the time I was being I was being raped brutally by an uncle and uh, I believed that I mean I believed for a year for a long time that the raping of a child put a demon in him so in my mind I was kind of convinced that that's what was going on but uh, they took me to a trailer uh, I remember it very clearly deep in the swamps it was like a short trailer and a man came out and he was really really tall and skinny very, very tall, and he had, he was an albino, or he gave the image, it seemed like he was an albino. He had white hair, very pale, his eyes were odd. He was wearing a, a button down blue shirt and tan pants like Dockers. I thought that was very odd for the, the exorcism man. But he took, they had me in this trailer and they started pouring garlic tea down me, just like tons of garlic tea, just very harsh. And he was bending me all these strange positions and drawing with garlic crosses all over my body and speaking like what I would call tongues now, but just constantly and contorting me and contorting me. And this went on for a long time. And the women were sitting in the corner praying and doing the rosary. And my mom was sitting in the corner looking kind of suspicious the whole thing. And then when he sent me home, he sent me home with, uh, I had to drink two cups, two cloves of garlic tea a day for I think, three months or six months or something. I can't remember exactly. But uh, the dream, oh, the dream stopped. And the stomach pains slowly went away. And everybody was amazed by it. But I thought about it years later because my, my stepdad came back from Nam, psycho. He was very heavily decorated. He got shot three times carrying a guy from behind enemy, line, enemy lines who had been shot six times. He saved that man's life. He got awarded, decked out and sent home came home a complete psycho, violent, violent, beat my mom, tortured us. But um, he hated me and my brother because we weren't his real kids. And he used to tie us to the back of the boat on a length of rope and just drag us through the water. That was kind of so he didn't have to put up with us. We loved it. We thought it was the greatest thing in the world. But I thought about it. You're in that bayou water, getting your mouth and your gut, parasites, stomach pain. I was sitting there, later on, I was like, garlic? What would garlic tea do? But chase parasites out of the body? <laughs> so I came up with a kind of a devil's advocate answer to the situation myself. But yeah, that was early on Louisiana, but that was like kind of my introduction to pain. And uh, there was a lot of pain, but uh, I think the garlic tea was an introduction to curing pain. <laughs> How would you describe your childhood in general? Uh, a series of molestations and beatings with moments of, uh, of painful clarity. <laughs> I was a very serious kid. My aunts and uncles said I was never a kid. All the pictures you see of me, I'm like very stoic and very like brooding looking. I was, there was a lot of violence. Uh, I was a mis, I was a t misfit. People didn't like me. Um, when I moved from Texas, Back to Texas. My mom was from Texas, and her and her two best friends were graduated and were headed to Miami. That was their big trip. 
but they saw a sign that said Grand Isle, the Miami of Louisiana, and they went down there and they all ended up working the same bowling alley and pregnant. And uh, that's why I'm here. But um, we moved back to Texas. We escaped him in the middle of the night. Um, he, when he came back from Nam, he took a job. He was a tugboat captain that took supplies out to the, to the oil, um, the, the, the big stands out there. I forget what you call them. But, uh, so he was 12 days on, 12 days off. Those 12 days off were great. It was like living in the swamps, Tom Sawyer, running around. I, I had little shacks I built in the swamps. I would sleep out there all the time. But um, when he was in, it was a living hell torture all the time. So anyway, we fled from him in the middle of the night, went to Texas, and we were very poor, like really poor. My mom worked three jobs. We ate oatmeal for months. Um, and I had, a, like I said, I had an uncle that was raping me. And later I found out he was raping my brother. I didn't know that at the time and other members of the family. But he was brutally raping me and it put this deep, weird guilt complex in me that I thought I was to blame for some Some reason. Uh, I think probably a lot of kids too. It's a horrible thing to go through. Um, yeah. The weird thing though is that I was really aware when I was a kid, like, like ultra aware. And I didn't tell anybody. One of the reasons I didn't tell anybody is I thought that my aunts and uncles would think all gay people were pedophiles, which isn't the case. So I literally went ears but I've never mentioned it. Yeah, uh, and then I'd see him, and as I grew older, I built resentment towards him. When I was younger, I don't know, I felt the guilt overwhelmed me, but later I started realizing. Sorry, that it wasn't my fault. What killed me though is when I found out it was happening to my brother that maybe I could have stopped if I had said something and my cousins and stuff, which is a lot to carry. Anyway, but uh, it was, uh, you know, there was great parts of my childhood. I was, uh, all that pain and stuff fed into my art. From day one, I was drawing and painting. My teachers let me stay in from pee and paint and draw. And I started playing guitar at seven. And I fell in love with rock music. I saw the Osmonds play at the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo. And I saw this team of girls jump the fence, run through, knock securities down, get up and do a crazy horse that steal Donnie Osmond's shoe. And then they ran and they ran right past me and there was these young, really attractive young girls. And I was like eight or something. And they jumped the f back out of the, it was in the Astrodome over the railing right by me and ran up. And I thought, that's what I want to do with my life. <laughs> Whatever makes girls do that. <laughs> is what I want to do. And that's what I started trying to do. I, was li I started running away at 12. I was singing a punk band at 12. I opened for DOA when I was 12 years old. I opened for the Subhumans, my very first show. And then a few months later, I opened for DOA. Um, and I've been in bands, you know, my whole life and sitting around art. I was living on my own completely. I went home and got all my stuff and said, bye at 14. Moving into an apartment downtown that my guitarist, had a studio apartment, a uh, garage apartment. He said, you can live here. Downtown LA? Down, this was in Houston. Oh, down Houston. Yeah. He said, you can live here as long, because uh, he stayed with his girlfriend, as long as you let me teach you algebra, <laughs> which I found very odd, very odd indeed. But then a few years later, when I got a full scholarship to Cornish Institute of the Arts without ever going to high school, well, I went seven days to high school, but, um, and passed everything because I learned algebra. <laughs> I realized, wow, that was real smart. <laughs> yeah, two years later, I got that. But um, um, yeah, I mean, my childhood was, I was very free because I started babysitting my brother and sister at eight years old. Uh, we were very poor and I was not, I was very much a misfit. When I moved to Texas, I had the thick Cajun accent and they tried to beat it out of me, put me in special classes. Teachers used me example how not to speak. So I sunk myself into uh, late night television. In Houston, they had these all night movie channels that showed old movies all night long. You know, a lot of horror, a lot of this and that. Sometimes some great art films, The Bicycle Thief I saw, you know, when I was like eight on. But um, 
I took the accents and the dialect and the dialogue from those movies and sung myself in that. So I went from being French faggot to English faggot <laughs> and so on and so on. But I kind of, I always won the president's award in vocabulary every year, but it was because of TV. People say you can't, TV is a bad babysitter, but for me it was, it was very good as far as learning how to use the language and understand the language, which was, you know, part of, you know, right. I mean, I sing, I write lyrics. But it was an interesting childhood. It was a painful childhood. I got introduced to, uh, I got handcuffed one time. My babysitter's uh, nephew or something was a security guard and he handcuffed me one night and he told me he wouldn't give me the keys. So I drank half a bottle of Jack Daniels and I did. And I think I was what, seven or so. And I drank half a bottle of Jack Daniels by myself. I think that was the first time I ever drank. Then I started selling, uh, I worked with this crew selling papers, descriptions he used to post in Chronicle door to door. We'd go and sell subscriptions. And it was like a bunch of juvenile delinquents in a van with a slightly older juvenile delinquent in charge. I mean, it was a lawsuit waiting to happen. If you, piss, if you did anything wrong, they did a wishbone on you. They would hold you down and beat you. There was sex going on, you know. Uh, it's like just this giant lawsuit. I can't, you couldn't get away with the stuff, but then you could. And uh, that's where I first smoked pot and people were taking acid and stuff. I didn't take acid yet then, but uh, that was kind of, the drugs were seeping in through the edges. And of course, hanging out in, a, I was hung out with older people a lot. I mean, starting from 12, I hung out with like old New York Dolls glam rockers and these cast of misfits that were left over from the 70s that were seeping, that got into the punks, the new emerging punk scene. Punk was still real freeform then. It wasn't like the hardcore. Orange County scene, it was more of a, it was more of an arty, weird crowd. So I remember being at parties and holding off people as they were shooting up and just talking, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, they, they treated me like I was a little uh, mascot because I was, you know, a 12 year old boy running away and I was very androgynous and very cute. So that made very interesting times. Um, but yeah, and uh, that's where I would get picked picked the tag up David Nobody because uh, no one knew my name and I wouldn't let anybody know it and anything to do with my former life. And there was uh, one of the radio stations had a, a, a uh, they're showing the premiere of the punk movie, the DOA punk movie with featuring the Sex Pistols. And there was a big premiere on Halloween night and they had the most punk contest. And it was all these doctors and lawyers with garbage bags and phone cords around their head trying to think what they thought punk was. and. I was sitting in the back and I was on a date with this girl, the bass player for the My Dolls. And interestingly enough, she's a lesbian. She didn't know I was a boy. <laughs> Until we started making out when she realized I was a boy and stopped the date. But uh, the, the big singer, Mike Hutchins, who later was in bands with me, one of my heroes, and Ray Trejo, the bass player for a band called The Bombers, ran up and grabbed me by the arms, lifted me up over the crowd and threw me on, ran me to the front of, and threw me on the stage. I didn't know what they were doing. And I had my overcoat was filled with beer. It went rolling everywhere. I was grabbing them, throwing them, putting them back in, screaming, fuck you, fuck you. And I won first place in the most punk contest. Um, and then I just, I was out. I was living on my own. And the world was my, you know, it was all new and learning and traveling. But uh, the drugs kept coming in more and more, you know. What year were you born? I was born in 1966. Okay. Yeah. Very, yeah, in February, I'm Aquarius. Um, yeah, I was, uh, in, I was born in Louisiana, as I said, raised up in Texas. Uh, I was a skateboarder. I skated uh, amateur sponsored for Zorlac. I broke a lot, I hurt myself a lot, a lot, a lot of pain. And then, um, but music started overriding that, but there was a lot of early injuries that to this day still still trouble me and that brought in some of the pain medications but um i moved to seattle in 19 i moved i moved from houston to austin right away and uh my girlfriend and i her parents were wealthy they were they owned an oil they built the pipeline her father um in alaska and they had a big mansion on mount mckinley and i used to fly up there and hang out and see her and then she and I moved to Seattle in 83. And, uh, you know, that was from Austin to Seattle, very interesting move. Um, Seattle was still young, was still dangerous in a water park town. And it felt, it was just completely different from Texas. 
you got to wear black leather all the time and um and but Seattle had a heroin scene you know where so much in Texas it's there but it's not obvious you know but in Seattle it was like everywhere there were like heroin bars you know there was bars downtown you walk in and the, the bathrooms we'd go in and you'd be like what's up with these walls? And then you realize they were covered in dried blood from people just squirting syringes. <laughs> they were like Korean, Korean mafia bars or something. It was like, it was a whole new world and it was very adventurous. But uh, it was weird too, because it was also, we were also young and everybody was so uh, innocent in a way, but you're getting all this stuff thrown at you. You know, it was, uh, it was, it was interesting. I saw a lot of people I saw a lot of people uh, take steps towards their their death or their demise. Then I saw a lot of people take steps towards being very rich rock stars too. So, <laughs> so the drug use continued. Yeah, throughout yeah. Your life? I mean, it wasn't like uh, it wasn't full on uh, um, being strung out all the time. It was more of like adventures, you know, but. Uh, it's, it got a little more intense, a little more intense here and there. Uh, at the time, it's funny too, because I had, a, you know, I had, a ba I had many bands, uh, but one of my bands, uh, we, we pushed a much greater drug use than we did. It was like kind of our thing was that we were completely wasted all the time. And uh, that built up a reputation that was far more advanced than the actual use was. People thought we were way worse than we were. And that kind of persisted throughout my life. There have been many times when uh, I wasn't on drugs, but people thought I was, and things were good as shit. And it was like, okay, might as well. They're already saying I am, what's the difference, you know? But uh, in between all that though, I always had major, you know, I did major things all the time. Uh, I always had this place I called my uh, future spot where I could see the future. And no matter what was going on, I knew the next step of what was going to happen. Uh, that future spot kind of went dead when Lisa killed herself. But uh, yeah, Seattle was a lot of fun. It was crazy. I saw some, you know, some tragedies, but it was, uh, like I said, it was kind of innocent. Everybody was really young, and it was like discovering new things. Of course, they were old things, but new to us. Um, and it was the beginning. You know, that whole scene exploded. Uh, you know, I just happened to be, I moved from Austin in a great time and then I moved to Seattle in a great time and uh, there was a lot of money going around, you know. I could tell a lot of, a lot of stories about a lot of well-known people that would get me in a lot of trouble. I won't do that. But yeah, um, in my life there's been times where I pulled in and out, you know, I've like, Ended up on the streets, homeless, kind of wanting to die, and then realizing I'm not gonna die, and decide, well, I better get out of this. And then, um, you know, then like having a remarkable, you know, great career building opportunities. You know, I've owned, ta I've not, I haven't owned tattoo shops. I've been worked in tattoo shops, partnered in tattoo shops. I've uh, worked in the movie industry. I've, uh, you know, I've changed every 10 years, I seem to change careers, but also there seems to be a great tragedy that seems to be back out on the streets for a while. Sometimes I think it's on purpose, like it's necessary to re to learn something. Um, this last time has been really hard though. It's, um, there hasn't been a lot of uh, innocence and uh, romance about it. It's been, um, it's been, uh, quite the opposite I didn't um, it's it, life-changing one of those life-changing things where you know just the wrong the wrong place the wrong time the whole world changed I got hurt really bad working on a commercial um, really bad I spent two months in the hospital I had traumatic head injury I see double out of one eye now. I have migraines and seizures. I had lost my, uh, uh, my, um, my depth perception is really messed up. Um, like if I go to grab something, I, I'm behind it, I'm in front of it. I 
if I put my finger on a dot and then close, open the other eye and close one, I'm two inches away from it. I, my, I, the left side of my body is badly, uh, was badly torn and, anyway, I'm, I got really messed up and I don't know if my former career, if I would be, if I'll be able to do that again. Um, and I'm fighting uh, workman's comp and there's lawyers and it's just been this incredible headache. I've lost everything. Uh, and I'm basically living, I went from living in my car, now I'm on the streets and uh, I don't see that future spot anymore. You lost it, you lost your car? It's not gone yet, but it's a, it's just under a thousand dollars. Uh, someone, I, I pissed off some drug dealers and gang members because I'm always trying to fight injustice and uh, they decided to put, to punish me and it's been a series of thefts and trying to steal my car and one thing they got was my, all my paperwork, my registration and everything. So they, if they stole my car, that'd be easy to sell, but um, that when my car got towed, they would not let me do anything towards getting it towed, provided it got all that stuff again. So it's just gone up. I could have had it the first day. It was three three thirty five straight off the bat. But I had to recover. I had to get all that stuff again, and I had to pay off some things and do some things. And so now it's like right under a thousand bucks. So I don't know. I'm still trying, but um, it's going to be hard. Um, yeah. So and also I'm not. I'm very, very uh, depressed. Manic might be a good term for it. I've always been manic. Uh, supposedly, I've been diagnosed as bipolar, but... Um, Living on the streets doesn't help that. No, no. And being robbed constantly, not having any place to keep anything, paperwork constantly gone. I had the... Uh, I took the immobilizer from my car. It's, it's a theft prevention device. Oddly enough, and I took it off because the car won't start without it. And I keep it in my chest pocket. And the other night I fell asleep on the streets. I go days without sleeping. I just walk and walk. It's so exhausting. But anyway, I fell asleep and someone got it. And it's really hard to find. Uh, they just, I there's found two, in the, there was two in the U.S. Uh, on Craigslist, or I looked up online, I was finding it. But uh, that's gone now, so I can't drive the car out a lot, so that's gonna be a big problem. And I can bypass that, but it's gonna take some work. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, this has not been, you know, my other adventures, as sad and tragic as they were, there was something like, you know, there was something kind of come from it, art, uh, writing lyrics, uh, I just felt, there's purpose. This, I have no idea what's going on. Every day the obstacles just get bigger and bigger. And every time I take a step forward, it's like a hundred steps back. And I have lost all faith in humanity. I've seen things out there that are unbelievable. The cruelty that people, the cruelness of people and the homeless robbing the homeless. You know, you can't fall asleep out there right now. There's no, you know, and it's a doggy. I mean, it's probably always been like this. And I mean, I know it's always been like this, but somehow I'm more on this time. I'm just, it's way more brutal. What is your drug now? Uh, well, I, oh, they, whenever they ask me about drug of choice, I say heroin, but that doesn't mean I'm doing it. It just means it would be my drug of choice. Fentanyl? Uh, well, I, I have been, I got really sick. I got E. coli poisoning and spent 14 days coming up both ends. And the only thing that would stop it or slow it down was a hit of fentanyl, um, Fetty. So that was the introduction to, uh, to that cruel, cruel substance. Very scary. It's like you taste it and you're like, I knew instantly this is not good. Kicking this must be horrible. Uh, the strength of it is, is frightening. Uh, the variety of it is kind of scary because if there's that, you know, there's a lot of, uh, 
I mean, the difference in batches or kinds and stuff is radical. Yeah, it's it's real weird, but yeah, that's what uh, that's been coursing through my blood of late. Yeah. What was a, what was a big, bigger factor in your current situation? The abuse and the, the the garbage you went through as a kid, or the things that happened later in your life? Well, what's weird, and it probably you can probably tell the way I'm talking is that a lot of things are coming up now from then. I was able to push all that aside or put it away or not think about it, but for some, I mean, maybe it's, I don't know. It's just, that stuff seems to be hurting me more now than it did back then. And uh, what was it? What was it? What was the big, what was that question again? No, just asking if, if the, like the child abuse, the sexual abuse you went through as a kid was a bigger factor in your current situation or some of the setbacks you had. At, okay, well, all that stuff, life. all that stuff I'm reviewing and it's coming through way stronger than I ever did before, combined with what's going on now. I mean, I've spent a lot of life in the last couple of, dec or couple of decades faking it till you make it, sort of uh, putting on a mask and just going, hoping something kicks in and starts working. And it does. Now it's like, it's, uh, it's like I write these songs and I'm, they're coming to fruition now. I, write this, I have this song I wrote for a long time ago about being, comparing homeless to being a ghost on the street. It's just like, it's a combination of that and the shit I'm seeing and the stuff I'm going through together. It's, I just feel like, I don't know, I don't, see a lot of reason to put up with any of it anymore. You know, it's like going through these, putting up this fight for what? What's the goal? And that, you know, kind of promotes numbing the mind. And I'm in a lot of pain. I hurt all over. I woke, when I woke this morning, I hadn't done anything last night. And so it was, you know, I woke up pretty clear and it was just, I wake up crying a lot if I'm in the wrong position because my body's so torn and broken. I was in the hospital for two months from that accident and they kept me there because they couldn't get my blood rate or heart rate down because the pain was so great. And at first they thought there was something wrong with my heart and they did a lot of tests and brought in a specialist and it turns out I have a great heart. I have like a really amazing heart. Uh, they showed me it. They had the uh, really fancy, um, uh, the thing you look at babies with. But, um, and my heart's great. So the guy said, it's not your heart. He goes, you're in that much pain. And they, they decided that it's because I've been through so much trauma and on so much pain medication that my brain just thinks it's pain medication is air, it's water. It's just something I intake constantly. And uh, so they put me on a ketamine drip this experimental pain, depression thing. And they put me on it for about a month and uh, it was just a big old giant bag of ketamine going down a hose into my arm. And after about two weeks, it started working. The pain medication started working. What they said it was gonna do, that my synopsis, everything is just, it all needs a reboot. They said my whole system needs a reboot and they're hoping that this is gonna reboot me into working. And it actually did. After about two weeks, the pain medication started working, at least enough for my heart rate to go down and me to get get released. They wanted to put me in a nursing facility for a while, but the uh, the workman's comp wouldn't have it. They wouldn't let it happen. So I, uh, they were going to keep me on that ketamine as long as they could. Um, I, th you know, I thought it was crazy at first, but it was working. But yeah, I. So it's a combination, the the stuff from the past and what I'm going through now, and just the horror that I see on a daily basis. And it's really scary out there is that I'm watching kids who, it would used to take 20 years for people to enter that kind of crazy screaming at the moon psychosis that you see. And I'm watching kids go into it in a year, two years. I mean, I'm watching young people beautiful, like healthy young people 
that are losing their minds. And all I could think, it's the drugs. The drugs out there are really strange. There's no, uh, like, Fetty is different, like, so, very so much, the fentanyl, they call it Fetty. And the, uh, and you know, most people are smoking off of aluminum foil, which isn't good. But, uh, and the speed now is so weird. Like, 20 years ago, speed was speed. You know, you had some different varieties, but it was speed. Now, it's just this mix, like, I don't know what's going on, but some of the drugs that are out there are just toxic. You know, uh, if you try to inject it, uh, you get giant gaping sores that aren't from missing. It's just from the chemical itself. Uh, yeah, there's weird stuff going on. I, you know, some people think it's the government experimenting, trying with the, the California's homeless. You know, there's a big strong theory of that out there. Um, and, uh, you know, every, there are many theories, but it's really weird. I don't know. I, I actually have probably con become more conservative in how I do drugs and the way I, in what it, with my drugs that I used to be because I'm kind of scared of what's out there now. Um, but anyway. What's your, what's your biggest fear? My biggest fear? <laughs> I was going to say live in another 20 years. Um, I think I'm not going to get to die. I, I'm going to be an old man. Um, my biggest fear is living a boring, mundane life. <laughs> <laughs> that was my fear as a little kid, and it's still my fear. The color brown, uh, <laughs> um, sandalwood, um, <laughs> top uh Top 40 radio. My biggest fear is probably that my biggest fear is dying, is living in these streets for another 20 years or 10 years. I don't know. I don't fear a lot. I did my, oh, I know what my biggest fear is. Getting, not leaving something good on this planet. Not doing something that met something. That's my biggest fear and that my name gets tainted. I fought long and hard to be a good person, to do the right thing. I mean, I don't know what your opinion, what your opinion is of drug users, but I don't rob people, I don't steal, try not to lie. Usually I only do it when it's to save someone's feelings. Uh, my biggest fear is that my reputation gets tainted and that I uh, don't leave something, some kind of good mark on the world. Something meaningful. Something meaningful, yeah. 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 I guess maybe that I died of, yeah, that I don't get to live long enough to, to do that. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's my biggest fear. Yeah, Emmanuel, what would you say is the most important lesson you've learned in your life? Uh, to trust my gut, <laughs> to go with my gut, to not overthink, and, uh, Don't let the bastards get you down. <laughs> That's a good one. All right. Emmanuel, thank you so much for sharing your story. I hope that worked. It was interesting. I felt like it was going off more into music than I'm not sure. No. Does it work for you? It is excellent. You're a fascinating gentleman. <laughs>